Um, so, uh, uh, so you could return multiple values in C, um, not directly via the language, but by returning a struct. So if you have a function that, um, you know, uh, function returning two args, okay, uh, returning two, two values, um, one way to do it would be to return a, a struct um, of some sort. Maybe it's a, a pair structure, right? A struct pair. And normally the way we do um, structures in C, um, there's actually an illustration of it in my code and it's worth paying attention to. Down here at the bottom, I, I defined uh, a struct here. And you'll notice that instead of saying struct pair every time, the cleaner way to do it is to do a type def. So uh, a type def is going to define a new type called command line dispatch entry, whose whose definition is given by whoa, is given by that struct there, right? Um, and then you don't have to keep on, you know, saying struct foo every time you use it. You just mention this. Uh, you use it as a as a type, just like I do there. Um, and that allows me to um, to more more cleanly refer to it. So I might call it, I might type def some struct to be called pair, and then I return a pair, right? So that's good. Um, you know this thing here. Okay. Um, so this doesn't work. I can't return more than you know two two things. So I can return a pair uh, pair of ints. Um, unfortunately, with pairs. What, what you often find is a language like C, we don't have a key thing we're going to be discussing soon enough, which is type parameterization. We can't say a pair of ints or a pair of characters or a pair of doubles. Um, word only that we could, but C doesn't support that. C++ does, but not C. And as a result, you know, we often get in this awkward situation saying it's a pair of ints, right? It's, a, it's an int pair or something like that, which is... Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it leaves a lot to be desired because you have this proliferation of types. Okay, so this is one way to do it with a struct. Um, so this is a type def struct, right? Um, please know about it. Type defs are, are a good way to help improve the, the clarity of code. What's another way to return it? I see this a lot from some of my students. Uh, passing pointers as arguments. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, um, we'll get to that one because personally I think um, that and this one are the, the cleanest way of doing it. Um, but, but how about another way that, that some students will do it? Return an, tr return an array. Say pass back an array. It's an array of two things or three things. Why is a struct more favorable than an array? Can anyone give me two reasons? Do you have naming conventions? Yeah, the naming convention. At least with structs, you have a, a labeling of what each element is, right? So um, that labeling will give you an idea of what these things are. Um, how about another reason? In fact, it's indicated here. What what would an array? Uh, what what's the limitation of an array? Each element of the array has to be the same type, same type right? So if you have a pair of ints, no problem. That's great. But if you have you know, a string and a pointer to a function, and it ain't gonna cut it. And and don't with a capital D. Don't even think about it, ladies and gentlemen. Casting them to void stars <laughs> and and keeping them all. Don't don't even let that thought cross your mind. Um, uh, that way lies madness. Um, so. Uh, C will let you do that. C is loosey-goosey if you want it to be, and therein lies a lot of its problems in terms of compiler optimizations, in terms of opportunity to parallelize. You can, you can do all sorts of things. Um, it's deuces wild, and the compiler is shortchanged as a result. It can't infer with confidence what's going on sometimes. Uh, okay, so one thing is we can return a pair with clearly labeled things. We could return an array, but that's generally counterindicated, returning some array. So, you know, an, an int an int thing like this, the function returning two values, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's ugly. I see students doing this in Java quite a bit. They want to return a couple things, they return this. Um, 
Now in Java, you don't have pointers. Um, so I have a little bit more sympathy to it, but you've got to allocate something and it's, it's just a little bit, a bit ugly. So in C, this is definitely counterindicated um, for, for most cases, certainly. Um, but the cleaner way to do it, sort of at the level of this struct would be, you might have a void here and then you have this function and what you do is you pass in, you know, a, a pointer to uh, an int, right? So here's a p, you know, x and, and p, y. Now the key thing here, ladies and gentlemen, is that conceptually these things are what we call out parameters. So they're parameters that are, um, that are set rather than merely read. And I should be careful here. The, 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 uh, the value that they point to is set rather than being merely read. Um, so you want to document clearly in the post conditions for this function that these things are set, right? There may also be preconditions. They may point to values which are depended on by that function too. So they can serve both ways, but conceptually they're functioning as return values as well. And you need to indicate that or else it could be you're passing a pointer to this thing for other, for entirely different reasons. Um, Maybe it's a, an array, okay? So, so uh, these are different ways of returning um, multiple values with the struct and the, uh, the pointer to, to, these, uh, to these arguments being the most advised way. And remind me your name again? Peter. Uh, Eric? Yeah. So Eric had noted that he had a fix, you know, make legal coordinates. Okay, so that's one way. How about another way? To get those coordinates to be legal. Yeah. Um, so I added a rule to uh, the num neighbors function. So yeah. Pass in kind of an adjacency rule. So uh, okay. you could pass in like the uh, toroidal or whatever it's called. Ah. Uh, uh, or you could pass Sweet. in kind of like the standard. Sweet. Adjacency. Sweet. So you parameterize the code so it could use either a toroidal space or a bounded space. Okay, I didn't require that, uh, although the, the, the thought mused through my mind, um, but that's really nice. My hat is off to you, that's, uh, that's great, my toque is off. Um, so uh, uh, impressive, and, and that allowed you to handle this case of toroidal as one of several cases. Um, provides extra flexibility with the code base. And how did you capture the logic for the toroidal space? The core logic of, okay, if it goes negative, it wraps around here. Uh, I just did like a mod on the... Yeah, um, yeah. So, th so that's, that's uh, and that's what I did. Um, maybe, maybe we should post Josh's code here for, uh, for example. But um, what I did is I eliminated, so I eliminated the check if it's legal. And basically what I did is, okay, so you're going delta row, delta column, these are just, you know, are you relative to the current cell, right? Um, relative to the current cell here, um, which we'll put it as, as this is kind of the, the current cell. Um, delta, delta call is the displacement from that. We're gonna be iterating through each of these guys, right? So this is delta row. Delta call is how far over we are from here. So minus one, minus one, we'll put us here. Uh, minus one, zero, we'll put us up here, et cetera. Um, and, you know, if we don't want to count the cell itself as being a count of surrounding live cells. And uh, basically the checking row, the row of the thing being checked is just um, this delta row plus the row mod the row count. So if, if we're at the edge, if this is the edge here, this minus will be, will be minus one modded with the row count. And what, what will the value be for that? Be a row count minus one, right? And, and that works really sweetly. It, it, uh, it basically will, will take it, take it round. It's, it's, uh, I don't, in, in 260, did you talk about Z? Uh, Z is the modulo basis. Zero. So mod, you know, um, 
mod uh, 32, 0 through 31, and, and do um, discrete math on that? No? Okay, you didn't use this notation? Okay, okay, this is, this is that notation with kind of a double, double uh, diagonal is used to indicate mod, the mo uh, modulo in mathematical terms. And I think you write it like Z32 or something like that, it'd be 0 to 31. In any case, um, this, this does it. And so that eliminates this uh, is legal because now it's, it's always legal, um, but it, it doesn't have the requisite generality of, of Josh's case. Um, but you have to have confidence about how the modulo operator works and, and you know, how it works with negative and positive, um, positive integers. Okay, um, so uh, that worked pretty well. And you can see here as well, um, the impact of this 2D uh, mapping, um, or, or turning, I shouldn't say 2D mapping, uh, uh, treating explicitly the array as two dimensions. Okay, but let's go back to what Royce was saying, which is treating the array as 2D actually had a pretty significant impact on the code base. So I typed out this to be called space. So I, I said, look, rather than always explicitly giving these things, I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a type called space, which is gonna note a, a two-dimensional integer array. And that allows me to just say space star, these things, it's a pointer to a space. Now, the thing that I wanted to talk to you about, because it's the thing that I find students can get awfully confused about sometimes, is what's really going on here in terms of pointers and equivalents and that sort of thing. Um, because yes, you have to be pretty careful here. You have to be pretty careful about clarity on pointers and you have to make some decisions. So one decision I made is, um, okay, so we have this space here and then down here we have um, buffer even buffer odd. So when I say space buffer even space buffer odd, what are these things? These are large two dimensional arrays, right? Big, big honk an array of, of, of integers, right? This one and this one, okay, great. Um, now, how are we going to pass around a pointer to which one we're dealing with, right? So, so in this code, we want to say like which space should be updated. You know, the cell is in which space. Update which space uh, here actually is picked within that. Um, and we want to return some reference to that space, some pointer to that space. How are we going to return it? There's actually three different ways I could have denoted um, a pointer to to uh, that array. Can anyone give me? Um, well, one of them is this space star. Okay, um, it's a pointer to that space. Okay, um, and that's a pointer to this two-dimensional array. So here's this two-dimensional array. Now, this being C, what sort of order is it in? Is it in row major order or column major order? Does anyone remember? How is it laid out? If we went and we looked in memory, like when you're in GDB, we looked at how it was laid out. Does anyone remember how it's laid out? These are rows and these are calls uh, here. What order is it, is it? Is it this way or is it this other way? Yes, it's, it's like this. So a columns, successive columns, are connect are, are are adjacent in memory. Okay, okay. So this is what we got. And if we have a space star, you know, some p, some pointer to the space, right? It's going to point to say the beginning of this space. That's one way to denote it. What's another way to denote it? They'll be perfectly legal. If I want a pointer to the beginning of the space. What's another? Why I could say a pointer um, to this place. The address of the variable. Good. Um, so so uh, I could I could write an expression. Yeah. If, if I if I had like buffer even, I could write you know ampersand. Man, I can never remember how to write ampersand. Um, uh, buffer buffer even. Okay. Uh, I could I could write that. But if I wanted it a variable that points to it. Um, there's things called erasers. Um, okay. Um, 
uh, if I want a variable to point to it, what other types could that variable be? So I want P array 2. Forgive my lack of imagination this morning. I have a P array 2, and it's a pointer to this thing. And I could call it a space star. What else could I call it? A, this is a space of int, so what else could I call it? And one thing I could actually do is call it an int star. Is it a pointer to an int? It, it is actually pointing to an integer here. It's pointing to an integer. Now, what's the difference between these two? So I could have, well, okay, I'm going to ask what's the software engineering difference. Well, okay, first I'll ask what's the mechanical difference. So here I have an int star. It points to this first guy here, or maybe it's a gal. Um, this first one, right? Uh, there it is, pointing to that. Okay. So what's the difference between these two? Are they interchangeable? Are they totally interchangeable? You don't know how large it is, not just a pointer. That is it. Kyle hit it on the head. You don't know how large it is with this. So let me, let me ask this. If I say P array 2, so I point it to this, this one, and, and I say P array 2 plus plus, where does it point to next? actually going to point to the next integer here now. After this point, it'll point to this guy here. It actually is it's going to increment it by one what? Integer worth. Man. When I was in grade school, I'll tell you a secret. I, I, I got a abysmal grade in handwriting. <laughs> and um, they, they uh, gave me the worst grade ever. I, I, I got a, a penmanship, I got a D. Um, and I'm sorry that you had to inherit it. Um, but I think from that point, it's only degenerated. Um, so, um, so in any case, this is, this is uh, a pointer to there. How if this guy is incremented? Where will he point to next? Or, well, we won't go into gender. Where will, it, where will it point to next? Well, it actually, if you did p space plus plus, where would it point to that? It would point actually after the, the whole space. This, this one knows how big it is, the, the dimension. This one just treats it as a pointer to some integer, wherever it is. Okay, so th there's a difference there. But what's the software engineering difference for sort of just treating this all as an int star. I could have said for update cell int star. Uh, I could have said counts running on cells to tell it which space we should look at the row and column. I, I could have said int star. What, what would have been the downside of that? Well, among other things, it's not, it's not putting into place the extra checking that's involved. If this is just an int star, you could pass it a pointer to one dimensional array, it'll be perfectly happy. It'll say, oh, one dimensional array, you want me to find the counts running line cells in it? That's fine. You pass it a uh, pass a reference to a two dimensional array, it will it will be perfectly happy with that. In short, the compiler's not doing its not doing work for you that it could do. And compilers, I know you folks probably have a love-hate relationship with compiler warnings and errors. Maybe, it's, maybe, maybe I'm overstating the love component. Um, I, I, know, I know we have a combative relationship. And at a certain high level, it reminds me of the relationship between testers and developers. Because um, the job of testers is to help developers by pointing out problems with their code. But the developers, you know, their heart doesn't always rise to the fore when they're told problems with their code. Um, and um, and as a result, um, you know, there can be testy relationships. And so it is with, with you and your compiler. But the point is, ladies and gentlemen, a compiler is warning you about something or giving you an error message. It's often so much better than experiencing a core dump or a bus error at runtime. That ain't no fun. Um, and it takes a lot longer to debug often. So a compiler 
if you can get a compiler to work for you to find your bugs before they turn into operational code, that's great. And you're missing an opportunity if you just pass things around like counts run and cells in star. You're just saying, hey, give me a, any old pointer to an end. I, I could, after all, if this was taking counts around and left cells, would take an int star. I could pass it, I could pass it, you know, if I have an integer variable v, I could pass it, you know, update uh, or, or count surrounding live cells, count surrounding da, 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 live cells, um, and I could pass it the ampersand v, right? Um, and, and the other arguments, you know, one, one, or whatever, um, zero, zero. Um, and it would be perfectly happy to treat this variable as if it's a space. Doesn't really make sense, right? Lou? Yeah, do you see what I'm saying? So calling this a space star, actually, while you needn't do that, you could treat it as an int star, um, you're missing an opportunity for the compiler to do work. With a space star, it's gonna be saying, is what you're providing it a pointer to one of these guys? Whereas if you're passing it an int star, it's all it's gonna be asking is, the compiler's gonna be saying, hey, are you giving it a pointer to an integer? Yeah, I'm giving it a pointer to a variable. Open sesame, go, go do your bidding. And this is one of the things that makes C so dangerous. You can do this and, and it will be off to the races and it will be looking into the memory space. So, okay, zero, zero, they actually ain't so bad. Give it zero, one, and it's gonna be looking whatever is stored just beyond the end of this variable, which is gonna be bad with a capital B. You agree? Well, okay, yeah, it can't be, especially with writes to it. Then, 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 then we're in trouble. Okay, so one way we could have referred to it as an int star, one way is a space star. Another way, another way, ladies and gentlemen, we could have actually referred to it as a pointer to a row. A pointer to a row here, and we, we could have written this like, Let's think about it. I want you to learn these, these principles of types in C. Okay, we could have written it like this. P, um, you know, P row, we'll call it P row. And this takes a uh, col column count. Column count. Well, I think I call it count columns, but in any case, uh, Okay, column count. Okay, um, when I was young and uh, I was uh, in professional development, 80% of the time I can get, like I pick a name for something, 80% of the time I'd have exactly the same name picked. And that's really useful because I'd know like what to search for based on what I would have called it. And it was really, really useful. Now I've lapsed. Um, so, so we could alternatively put this, and now I'll point to this row. So let's read this. So I'm given this pointer, and if I dereference this pointer, if I take a star on it, then what I get, if I then index into it, I will get an int. That's, again, how you read those things, right? If I have this, and I take a star of it, it's gonna be the space here. Um, so uh, that's what it's pointing to the, to the space. Here, if I have this, I take a star of it, then I take, I index into it, it's gonna give me an int, right? Um, here, whatever I have, if I, if I take a star of it, I'll get out an int. These are all different legal ways of referring to this. Now, if I do P row plus plus, where do I point to that? Anyone? <coughs> the next row. Yeah, the very next row. These are three ways I could have called this thing. And I chose, for software engineering reasons, I chose this because the compiler, I wanted the compiler to work for me. I didn't want the compiler to just allow me to pass any old reference to an int variable as if it's a space. I wanted to do this. And you notice how I use those type defs there to help ensure type, type safety here. Type defs are your friends too. They allow you to just say space, and really what you mean is an int of these, uh, you know, these uh, 
with a two-dimensional interlay. Okay, let me ask one other question. How is this different from a um, from an array of stars? An array of row int stars. Anyone tell me that? So if I had if I had an int star um, and and this was a I'm going to separate this because this is tempted to call it p different or something like that. Um, uh, okay, so we have we have this and we have um, count. Uh, Okay, we have how many of them? How many int stars do we have? Um, we're we're going to have uh, row many int stars, row count int stars. How would that be different than this? Yes. Well, then what you have is you don't have this two dimensional array. What instead you have is an a vector of or a, an array of successive pointers to each of them pointing to some integer, right? Um, so it's, and it's an array of in stars and each of them might point to a call, a, a row or you know, a specific row, for example. Um, but the point is um, they could also, there's no guaranteeing that, they could point to a variable, for example. Um, so this is quite different from this guy here. And not to mention this is column, this is, this is count. Um, an array in C, a 2D array, is not merely a, an array of pointers to each of which is a pointer to, to another array. It's, it's actually laid out in memory as a block. Okay? So that you may have struggled with that. I hope that's helpful. To me, the cleanest thing to do is to type def and put in a star to, the, to this type def, okay? Are you okay with that? Okay. Trip down memory lane. Some of you may graduate and go to Vexima or go to IRD or go to IBM and work in the compiler group or whatever. And not all of you will be working with, with um, you know, C, C language uh, programs uh, every day. Some of you may rarely do it, but it's worth remembering a couple principles. Number one, use type tests to clean things up. Number two, uh, you you should use you should make the compiler work for you using appropriate types. Even if you can call it multiple things, some of those give stronger guarantees than others. Um, and uh, further by sort of uh, clever use of operators, often you can, um, you can clean up the space by, for example, um, doing this, um, this, this modular, modular operator there, it can, it can clean things up. Um, hope that's helpful. Hope that's helpful in terms of some aspects of, of C. Okay, so now, ladies and gentlemen, now we're gonna be going on to something uh, that finishes up our, um, our discussion from last time uh, by just talking a little bit about optimization. And we're gonna come back to this topic, so I don't wanna spend too much time on this. But last time we actually saw that optimization could allow us to really speed up a program. So we had a profile of a program, and we saw that by doing minus cap O2 or cap O3, we could secure many at least several binary orders of magnitude of speed up, uh, maybe four times um, to eight times, what have you. Uh, and uh, we could often really reduce the differential between a program that is written without functional abstractions and those written, written writ with, okay? Um, so compilers are often designed to take advantage of optimizations. And as we'll see, language has a big impact on our ability to optimize, okay? Um, the, the structure of a language. C is close to the metal, but it hides a lot of things that would allow a compiler to, or I shouldn't say hides, it prevents a compiler from doing certain types of analysis because it's not safe. 
So I want to talk with you a little bit about optimizations. The main one that occurred that helped speed up our program a lot was function inlining. What do I mean by inlining a function? Replacing a call to a function with the function. Yeah, exactly. Replacing the call with the function itself. It turns out that that's just one of many optimizations that was likely applied to that program. And if we had gone into it, we could have probably teased out more. Another, um, and, and I've listed here, some of these are things that involve low-level details about how the assembly language works. Um, for example, what registers are being used for which variables, etc. Um, if we talk about taking, let's let's take a look at some some code, right? Uh, if we take a look at uh, code like this, um, uh, what what variables might be allocated to a register to make this code uh, pretty fast here? Anyone? Rather than putting them in memory, what things if we if we had a register we could store a value here? Which things might be good to put in registers? Delta row and delta column. Delta row and delta column. Those are changing a lot. And it would be even clearer if these were changing over larger, larger, you know, spans. Let's let's go up to a one where it where it iterates through here, row and column. Great example. <clears throat> put row and column into registers. And then you don't have to worry about um, uh, about putting them in memory every time taking them back. Why is there a difference between that? If you looked at the assembly code for this, why why would it matter if they're in, in registers rather than than in memory? Registers are faster. Right? Registers are just incredibly faster. Memory can be fast if it's cached and so on, but there's only so much that can be stored in the cache. Okay. Okay. So. Row, row and column are great things to have in here. What prevents things from going into registers? Well, if I had passed, notice I pass row and column here. These are two values I'm passing, right? The current contents. Is. If I pass a pointer to row, now it has to be incredibly careful. Why? If I had instead passed the top date cell pointer to row, why does why does it potentially have to take it out of the register? Because the pointer might be pointing to the register. Okay, yeah, the pointer might be updated by what I call, and if it's in a register, it's it's not going to be able to directly update it from this this program called. You can't you can't pass a pointer to a register. You can pass a pointer to a memory address. And as a result, it will have to take a, it, it won't be able to store it in a register on a persistent basis. Uh, at the least, it will have to store it in memory and then pull it back from memory after the call, and, and it's, it's a mess. So the point is that, that um, depending on what we pass around, register allocation may be possible or not. That's, that's one issue here, and that's one type of optimization can be quite powerful. Often when you make a, a call, you have to actually save away everything that's in registers because the next call might, the thing you're calling might need those registers. And, and if you inline things, then that means you don't have to save away those things from, regi from registers into memory. You can just keep on using them. You just substitute in the body, substitute. That's why inlining is so valuable. But the key thing is you don't have to inline. And you don't have to sacrifice the maintainability of your program to achieve those benefits. You can tell a compiler to do it. You can actually, in GCC, you could tell, you could explicitly say inline this function as a general rule. Okay, so this, this is one issue, uh, register allocation. Another thing is this common subspression uh, elimination. This is if we have certain expressions that are used again and again, certain formulas, it'll actually just compute it once, if possible. Um, it won't compute it multiple times. If it sees the same thing again and again, it will say, oh, I can do that, I can do it once. And there's a set of other things involving, like, if you are successively adding values uh, or multiplying things, every instance of a loop will just turn into adding. So instead of, if you have a loop, for example, which, which is, you know, for int equals zero, i equals zero, i less than some value, I plus plus, and within the loop you have you know I times N being used every time. 
each time i is just getting one larger and you could instead of doing this multiply you can just basically add an every time to the value from the last time and it turns out that's faster and so compilers are, are really good at these things um uh they can also identify dead code code that's not used and they can oh this says loop enrolling it's loop unrolling folks um where they actually unroll a loop so an example of unrolling this loop is something that occurred in the original code. Let's go look at that. Where's the ugly? Ah, there it is. Um, there's the ugly code. Do you see how this code here is kind of an unrolled version of, of this code um, count surrounding cells? Um, this guy here, do you see that? This, basically, you could unroll this loop just repeat ad nauseum this stuff for each successive value of delta rho and delta column except this guy here. And that's exactly what this guy does. It's just unrolling it. And a compiler can do that for you. So the message here is, ladies and gentlemen, don't think that you have to sacrifice the maintainability of your code to manually do these things that a compiler can do behind the scenes automatically on your cleaner code. You know, this, this is an invitation to disaster, particularly with these, these constants in there. But it's an invitation to disaster also in the form of all these checks and stuff that are not clear. And even if we improve the naming, we'd have duplication of lots of conceptually similar code. By contrast, here, it's more clear what's going on. And what I'm saying is the compiler will actually unroll this for you. It, it can unroll this for you. So a minus O2, minus O3, it can progressively more uh, aggressively do things like unroll this loop. And if a good compiler might discover, okay, you continue in this case, it will actually just unroll it and leave out this case. Compilers are that good sometimes. They can transform your code in ways that will improve the speed behind the scenes without you having to, to manually you know, abuse your code to make it happen. So um, these are examples of compiler optimizations that we exploited last time and we saw those big speed ups. Um, if you haven't exploited uh, those sort of optimizations before with C or with other languages, it's good to be aware of them and it's good to be aware of how much it will do for you that won't require you to twist your code accordingly, okay? Those are some comments on optimization. Really, that was sort of finishing up the next last lecture. Okay, um, and so now we're going to be going on to something uh, quite different. Um, we're going to be talking about um, uh, elements of functional programming that are incorporated into many languages these days. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's talk about um, uh, this with with an eye towards. Um, towards uh, trying these out in the popular language Python. Okay, um, so it's in this beginning of this lecture, I wanted to, to mention again this term for the first time in a slide, I think, metalinguistic abstraction. We as, we as computer scientists are in a very lucky position in the sense that when we have problems given to us, when we have challenges posed, we can often pick not only pick our tools to do the job, we can pick the language we use to phrase the problem. And you know, uh, if you go out there and look, you'll find lots of people acknowledging that often the key to, one of the big keys to solving a problem is, is framing it in the right way, specifying it in the right way, allows an answer sometimes to fall out. And so it is with languages. By picking the right language, we can often really simplify our job. So if you're doing string manipulation, again, you don't use C, typically. You use something like Perl, or you use something like awk or sed, or maybe features of Ruby that are quite nice for string manipulation. But um, if you're going to be solving combinatorial problems, sort of matching, you might use something like Prolog, right? You folks, many of you have seen Prolog, yeah? Um, so as software engineers, we're given problems, we can select the means of specifying the solution with our language. More than that, we can actually create our own languages. And we'll talk about domain-specific languages later in the course. Um, okay, so 
we're going to be talking about use of functional programming elements in traditional languages. This includes uh, Python, but increasingly it includes a wide variety of languages. Um, uh, I mentioned uh, Scala, um, but also Ruby. Um, uh, contains some important elements of functional programming, um, as does the latest version of Java. So these are not pie in the sky, airy fairy ideas that you know you'll never apply in a real program. No, these are these are well supported things in languages that can make your programming cleaner. Um, and there's some characteristics of this, um, and they go by highfalutin names: functional decomposition, breaking a program up into functions. Well, you've seen that. Immutable values. What do I mean by immutable value? Anyone? Immutable value. Yeah, you're, okay. So it's, it's not merely being mutated over time. So it's a value once created, it doesn't get modified. And it turns out that this is really useful for compiler optimizations. Why is that? Well, if a value is being modified, the compiler is often worried, oh, it's going to be changed out from under me. I, I can't count on its existing value, so I have to go keep on checking what its value is. Mm -hmm. um, if it's immutable, often it can do certain types of optimizations where it just reuses the value from earlier, for example. Or it shares that value between multiple things. Rather than computing it multiple times, it'll just share the one instance of it, because it's not going to change out from under it. Another thing with immutable values is you, you don't have issues of dependency. This has to go before that. So you can do what? Dependency is the enemy of what? Dependency limits what? What big type of, of gain? What big type? Yeah, what's that? Parallelization. Parallelization. So if you have immutable, immutable values, you can more aggressively parallelize things because you know this doesn't have to be done before that, except in the obvious way the value has to be produced. Um, you don't have to worry, oh, it's going to be updated, so that update has to happen before this other thing happens, or what have you. Pure functions, functions are just return values. Uh, transparency of the code via what I call equational reasoning, and, and that's a, a term that's used in, in the literature for this. So basically, you just you can, you can look at it, it's almost mathematical, to figure out what this is, you could simply substitute in the appropriate values. What we'll call higher order functions, functions that take and return functions and uh, closures. Um, we're going to be seeing those uh, potentially today, depending on how far we get here. Okay. Um, and more recursion, less iteration. It turns out that you can, compilers can turn recursion into iteration in, in certain cases, tail, tail recursive structures. Okay. So we're going to be going through in the next, in this week, we're going to be going through a set of very specific uses of functional programming contexts that are very useful these days. Um, how many people on here have um, heard of MapReduce, for example? Okay. Where have you, what class uh, introduced that, or is it outside of classes you heard about it? Mobile and cloud computing. Okay, good, good. So did you talk about Hadoop, for example, some, and, and the fact that with large-scale data repositories, Often, one of the most uh, favorable ways we can deal with these large amounts of data are through a combination of, of these constructs, map and reduce. So we, we, we sort of apply operators to the data, we reduce it up by totaling things up or averaging them or, or uh, otherwise sort of summarizing them, what have you. So we're gonna be talking about three big mechanisms of functional programming that are exposed in all those languages I mentioned, map, reduce, and filter. But before that, we're going to talk about creation of, of abstractions uh, and particularly anonymous functions and closures, which are a very important concept, and which set, set those languages apart from C with its pointers to functions. Okay, so many of you folks have used Python, and you, know, you will be familiar with the simple, spare syntax that Python used to denote programs. Um, Python is is admirable for sort of clarity of, well, for simplicity of sort of code in terms of the amount of verbiage required. So here's a definition of square in Python, right? Takes in an argument, returns 
the argument prints itself, right? Increment takes in an argument and returns x plus one. Most of you familiar with it, or many of you familiar with these? Yeah, okay. So we do square of three, we get nine, increment of three, we do four. Notably, Python is, is a um, interpreted language. So, and this is gonna have some implications we'll talk about in terms of flexibility. It gives us quite some flexibility. It also costs us uh, in certain things. But we can simply write in the read eval print loop square of three and we'll get nine. We can type increment of three and we'll get four, right? Um, so uh, I have Python here and I may uh, pull it out. Okay, now some of the most powerful use of, of functions, however, in, in uh, the context of Python and, and more generally in the context of, of uh, functional uses of those languages come with unnamed functions. These are, these are functions that are called uh, anonymous functions. How many people in here have used, outside of Haskell, have used anonymous functions? Okay. And what languages uh, were you using those in? Java. Java? Java 8? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So Lambda expressions? Um, good. So um, for you folks, it'll be, it'll be a, a you know, fairly, very familiar, but we'll, we'll be coming to some aspects of it that might might uh, sharpen some understanding there. Um, so these functions are created to accomplish some specific, I say rare task, what I mean is some specific ad hoc test, uh, task. I really should change that, it isn't rare. It's just that it's it's sort of ad hoc. We don't declare a uh, ad hoc or dynamic task. We can't declare a function for this that sort of persists on an ongoing basis. We just need it in this case, or we, we're creating this function for a very particular uh, context. Um, so we don't have to give it a name to, to reuse it. Um, and anonymous functions play a very important role in functional programming, to, particularly to be returned back from a function or to be passed to a function. So the way we write functions is, is a nod to their history in what's known as the, the Lambda calculus. And um, for those who took uh, 340, uh, did you talk about the lambda calculus at all? Yeah, okay. So, so in the lambda calculus, you could write, for example, a lambda, which indicates a function. Um, you know, lambda of, I don't know what syntax you used, lambda of x, x times x, right? Um, and what function is this going to denote? This denotes what function? Square, Square right. So it's, it's the square function, and it takes in, an, say, an integer, and it returns an integer, if we, if we limit ourselves say, here to integer, right? Um, and, and this arrow means it takes us in as input, it, it puts us out. Okay, um, so lambda of n, n plus one, what is this? What's, what's the job of this function? It does what? It, given a value, it does what to it? Increments, it returns back, right. This does what? Given a value, it doubles it. Um, not in the sense that it modifies it, but returns a value that's, that's double it. Okay, now, this later one we're gonna come back to. What is, anyone wanna venture what this one does? So, I'll, I'll write it up on the board, because I know it's far, okay. Um, mm, mm. Okay. Okay, so this is lambda of c, okay, come on. Lambda of c, lambda of n, and then n plus c. So what's the job of this function in life? I'll, I'll write it, I could write it this way too. What's, what's the job of this function? Add two numbers. Okay, it adds two numbers given successfully. So if we call this thing f, um, we could apply f first to one number, right? This guy here, um, say to one, and then we could apply it to, to two. I'm using this to indicate, okay, it's being applied to that. Um, and f of one, what is this gonna return back? So if you give it c, what is it gonna give you? Function that adds one to whatever number you have. That is it, yeah, so it's gonna, this thing is going to itself return a function. This is a higher order function. This is a function that given a value, its job in life is to return another function that's going to add that value onto other things. Okay, um, 
onto whatever it's given. So given a one, it's going to return a, a, a function that given two is going to add one to, the, to two, right? Or if this was n, this is going to give back what? What is this going to give back, this whole thing? If, if I, I say, if I take n, what is it going to give back? That's going to give back n plus one. If, if I give f of two and, and I applied it to n, it's going to give back n plus two, okay? Um, does that make sense? Okay, we're going to come back to that. And there's some, there, there's some things going on automatically there. Um, and this has to do with this notion of a closure. And this is going to be key. It's going to be key as the differentiator from pointers to functions. It's going to be key as, the, as a lot of delivering a lot of the value of anonymous functions. If you don't understand closures, you won't appreciate just how powerful these things are and just how, how liberating they can be in certain circumstances. OK, great. So, um, so these are statically defined uh, functions in, excuse me, these were statically defined functions in uh, Python. Here are some dynamically defined ones. Here's square given as this, right? Increment given as this. And you can write this in Python, no problem. So we just say, let the word increment, you know, this, this variable be bound to, to this function, right? Which is, you know, gives us the same, same basic operations as this. You'll notice the output is, is the same, right? Um, it's the same function, it's just declared in a more dynamic way. Um, okay, so this notion of closure is going to be key to this. And basically, um, what we're going to have is a, a linking up of a function with some scope, some information that provides the values used in it. And the way we term this is normally an environment, okay? So, so when we create a function value, a, that, that function is not going to be taken in isolation. It's going to have certain knowledge about the values of, of that variable. So this guy here, n plus c, it, well, for this whole function, when this is returned, lambda of c dot lambda of n dot n plus c, when it, if we give it a c and it returns a function, it's lambda of n, n plus c, um, that, that inner function needs to remember the value of c that was there when it was created. So if we say function applied to one, um, you know, the whole function applied to one, it, it needs to remember the fact that c is one when it's applied to a successive value. So, so right here, uh, for example, um, if it takes in c, it returns lambda of n m plus c. And so if we give this thing increment by function generator the argument 2, it's going to, it's going to evaluate, okay, c is 2, and it's going to return a function whose job in life is to increment things by 2, whose job in life, it's returning a function that's going to take an n and add 2 to n, right? Right? Okay. Now, in doing that, it has to remember what c is, right? Yes, no. What is c? So if, if I give increment by function generator the argument 2, it has to remember c is 2. So whenever this function that it's returned is applied to things, it knows to increment it by 2. On the other hand, if we say increment by function generator you know, 33, it needs to remember that the function that returns c is 33. Hmm? People comfortable with that notion? OK. So it's not merely that this guy here, increment by function generator, given a c, it returns some function in isolation. It actually returns a function that, that is bound up with an environment that knows what c is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it remembers c for its particular case. It remembers c. You may call increment by function generator in one case on 2, when it returns a function, and there, for that function, c is 2. Another time you apply it to 33, and for that time, c is 33. And those functions can coexist. You know, the one that knows how to add 33 to things, or 2 to things, because they remember their value of c themselves. So it's not merely returns a function, it returns a closure, uh, an association between the function and an environment that tells, gives the value of, of, in this case, c. Does that make sense? Okay, we'll 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 come to this. So let's let's go. 
let's go uh, check this out. And we'll be returning to this next time. And I'll be providing all these slides so you can, you can look at them. Okay, here's this increment by, right? Fn increment by. Its job in life is to take a value and return a function that increases things by the value. But when I say return a function, I actually mean return a closure. It's a function with a knowledge of what C is, right? So, so you know, I could create another function, Fn, sin, uh, you know, simple increment that is Fn increment by one. That's this first one applied to the value one, right? This guy here applied to value one. And I could then apply this guy to five, and I'll get back six. But I could also do f and add 10, which is this guy applied to 10. And it returns a function, this guy here, whose job in life is to add 10 to things, because C is bound up with 10. For this guy, C was bound up with 1. And so fn single increment has a function where C is 1. This guy has a function where C is 10. And we're going to come to map, but for example, I could take this function and apply it. And these two guys can live together. I mean, you could have many, many, many you know, particular functions with different values of C, and they're all perfectly happy. Each of them knows what their value of C is. Are you comfortable with that? We're going to be talking about mapping, but basically this is going to apply this function here to each element of some test array and apply it. Um, by contrast, we, we might apply this one to each element of test array and get, get, get different output. And in, in this case, it's just going to be incrementing each value of test array by 10. In this case, just by, by um, a single one. OK. Um, right. Now, we can, and this may seem strange, but we will also sometimes and it's very useful to do this, have a lambda expression, have, a, have an expression which finds a function that takes no arguments. Now, that's not the same as, as just not doing anything. You have to call it just with nothing for it to do its job, OK? Um, you have to call it foo with begin paren and paren. So its job in life is to, is to take nothing as an argument and do something, return something. Um, but it doesn't, that function doesn't just give you the value it's going to return. You have to call it first. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is a lambda expression. It's, it's a function, but it takes nothing as an argument. We see those all the time in C, right? It doesn't take anything as an argument, and it updates the screen with an image of the professor, something like that, right? Okay, maybe, maybe you don't see that one all the time. <laughs> Maybe because you delete it if you saw it, um, but uh, but um, one can imagine it. Um, uh, and the point here is this long computation might only take place when you call foo. So you say foo equals lambda of nothing, takes nothing in, and but when we call it, it'll perform a long computation. So you have this foo, and it knows how to perform this long computation, and when the time is right. And the professor rears his ugly head. If boom, <laughs> if you, you call it, and it does a long computation, right? Um, yeah. Okay. So that's this here. You have to call this function to do things. Now you may wonder why in the world would we need that at practical level? Well, it turns out it's super useful, and we'll probably be taking a look at this in the context of streams uh, in a little bit um, later in the course, but um, or big nums. But the idea is that we can build up things that, that will do a job for you if you need it. Those of you who are in, um, who are in 340 will have seen lazy languages. Is that right? Do you see laziness? OK. Um, uh, so um, with laziness, you know, something's only computed if you need it, right? It's only computed when you, when you need it, you get it. And so it is with streams. It will give you the value if you need it, but if you're not going to do something with it, it won't compute it. Same thing with big nums. Big nums might represent the value of pi, for example. And it will give you as many digits as you want at a time, but the rest it won't compute yet. It'll just be waiting. You want more? I'll give you more. You want more pi? Another slice coming up. And it'll give it to you, but but it won't go out and compute it all ahead of time. After all, it would never com complete. It will just give it to you on an as-needed basis. 
And that's what this allows you to do. Another example would be event handlers in a, um, in a uh, interactive system where, you know, when you click on this button, do this. Um, so you give it a lambda expression where, you know, when it's called with no arguments, it does what the button should do. So you, when you push on this button, perform this calculation. Or when you push on that button, perform that calculation. And we're telling it what to do when you push on the button by giving a lambda expression that takes no arguments. Does that make sense? Lambda expressions are really useful. Anonymous functions are really useful. Again, I can't emphasize that more, that enough, that I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving these examples in Python, <coughs> partly because Python's a, an interesting language. It's a very useful language. It's a language I think graduates should at least be somewhat familiar with. After all, tons of web stuff, scientific stuff, uh, stuff of all sorts uh, is done in, in Python these days. But also because these are general concepts. So you could do the same basic thing again in Java 8, in Scala, you could do it in Haskell, you could do it in uh, Ruby, you could do it in any number of different languages. Okay, um, ML, etc. Okay, so we're, we're going to take a brief look at a few of these um, common functions. The first of them is going to be um, map, but but each of these is going to represent something different. So map is going to represent a mapping, a transformation of each element of a collection. We're going to have collections. And for each element of that collection, we're going to be applying a function to it. So we're going to give it a collection, and we're going to get back a collection of the same size. But the collection we get back is going to have had to each of its elements. Each of its elements is going to be produced by applying a function to the corresponding element of the input collection. So you give me a collection in of, of negative and positive integers, I'm going to give you back a collection of the squares of those, right? Make sense? That's map. Filter, as its name suggests, is going to take in a collection, and it's going to give me back another potentially empty collection, where basically uh, it's just going to be a subset of the, the ones that I, I had in the original collection. A subset that meets some criteria, meets some condition, satisfies some predicate. You can speak about it in different ways. But it's going to be filtering them through. So I might give you that collection of negative and positive integers, and you give me back, I say filter this, so only those greater than zero are given to me, and you give me back a collection where it's a subset of the input collection, all of those in the input collection that were greater than zero. Reduce it's going to represent accumulation or summary. It's going to give back um, give back some some value that's going to be a summary of all those values. Maybe it's the total. Maybe it's going to sum them up. Maybe it's going to concatenate their strings. Maybe it's going to um, take their average. Right? That's reduction. And it turns out that each of these is what's called a higher order function. Anyone remember from my utterances not 15 minutes ago? What does, um, what, what do I mean by a higher order function here? If I say these are higher order function, give me, give me some understanding of what that means. It's not a function that takes other functions in as a parameter. Function takes other functions in as, as arguments in this case. It can also denote a function that returns other functions. Both of those qualify as a higher order function. And of course, there's some beautiful functions that you will see um, that, that will both take a function in and return a function. OK, so let's talk about map. Here's map. OK, here's Python. Go try this out. And I ask you to try it out for Thursday, OK? Here's, a, here's an array in Python. Oh my gosh, this, this, that should be a, <laughs> what's going on here? Um, OK, let me, let, me, um, uh, let me go correct that. Hey, come on, boom. Okay, um, okay, um, pseudo Python. No, this is real Python. Okay, great. Um, and um, we're going to now square the elements of this collection. Okay, so we're going to map over this collection. This test array was what I just showed you. Test array here, um, and I'm going to square each element of it. So I'm going to map over that array this lambda expression, which whose job in life is to take a value and return the square of the value. So I'm going to map it over each element. So each element of the original collection is given. I, so what I get out of this 
I pass in a collection of functions, and what I get back is, is a collection also of equal size to the original collection, where each element successively in this new collection has that function as a result of applying the function to the, success, to the corresponding element of the input collection, right? So the first guy here, one, is just the square of the first guy and the other collection. The second guy here, four, is the function applied to the second guy here, minus two, square is four. Third guy to the, the square of the third guy here. Okay, pretty, con uh, pretty simple concept. Okay, um, how about this guy? Okay, so here, can anyone tell me, well, adding a fixed value of one to each element, right? Can anyone tell me what that, uh, it's hard for me to cover that one up. Um, okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, how about this this next one? What is this doing? Okay. I'll I'll tell you. This is Python syntax. It's kind of I I don't know. I think it's kind of a strange syntax. Um, uh, but this is the ternary operator in Python. It's an if, not statement, but an if condition, or sorry, an if expression. So if this is greater than zero, use one, otherwise use minus one. Okay, so that's what it is at a, at a detail level, but what's the, what's the overall function being computed here? It's essentially absolute value. It's the absolute value, yeah. Yeah, look, um, if, if this value is greater than zero, just use the value itself, but multiply it by one, otherwise, take the negative of it, right? Um, if for zero, it comes out in the wash. So this is gonna, this is just taking the absolute value of, of these things. Now, I could have written that in a neater way, but I did want you to see uh, ternary operators. That will be useful for your, ex for your uh, assignment one, okay? Um, a lot of this is undertaken because you will be doing some Python programming assignment one. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, I'm going to leave that for the next time. Okay, filter, um, select, okay, right. Um, okay, so for example, we could build things up out of these things. Um, so here, uh, we're going to take in a, for example, a predicate, and then take in an array, and we're going to apply this thing called filter for that predicate in the array. The predicate here is a function. Okay. And having done that, we can then reuse that. For example, I could say, okay, I'm going to create a big string length pen filter, and its job in life is going to be to take in a string, and if the string is, is uh, greater than a blank 10, uh, excuse me, so, so it's going to create a filter that, given an array, is going to filter out and, and include just those strings whose length is greater than 10. So given an array, I'm going to get back out of this another array, um, which is going to consist of a subset of the elements of array one, to wit, the, that subset whose length was greater than 10, right? Um, this was the criteria I passed on. Where did this filter from predicate came from? It's this guy up here. So. Um, basically, given this function, given this predicate, it's going to give back a function that given an array is going to filter out the elements of that array that match that predicate. Does that make sense? And similarly, I could say you know, positive threshold filter, filter from predicate, you know, n greater than zero. And this one will extract from whatever array is given all those elements whose value is greater than zero and give it back to me as a new collection, okay? Um, okay, I think we'll leave it uh, at that. Uh, next time we're gonna see something about filter generators, but I'm gonna ask you to do some playing around with Python for next time just so you can get a little bit familiar with uh, the interactive nature of the language and the syntax so you can get going on exercise one, or excuse me, assignment one as soon as possible. Thank you, folks. And I will see you on Thursday.